Now, I've drawn an extraordinary picture here of an amoeba and a human cell. Amoebas are these kind of blob-like cells that live in pond water. And really, it doesn't matter whether we talk about an amoeba or a human cell, there's a lot of similarity between the two. Uh, in the amoeba, the cytoplasm, in, cytoplasm inside the amoeba is 80% water. That's what it is in all cells. And since it's mostly water that's inside the cell, it's also known as ICF. What does ICF stand for? It's written right here, intracellular fluid, the fluid inside the cell. Now, all living cells have to live in a fluid environment or they'll die. And an amoeba lives in pond water. That's its fluid environment around it. The fluid around a cell is also known as the ECF, or extracellular fluid. Extracellular means outside the cell. So that's an amoeba. It's, most, it's got fluid inside the cell, it's 80% water, and it lives in a fluid environment outside the cell. What about our cells? This cell represents a human tissue cell. It could be a liver cell, it might be a pancreas cell, it might be a skin cell, it doesn't matter. Just like the amoeba, the cytoplasm is 80% water. Since it's mostly water, it's also known as intracellular fluid. And just like the amoeba has to live in a fluid environment, there has to be fluid around all living human cells. This fluid is known as tissue fluid. So tissue fluid, the fluid surrounding human cells, is the ECF, or extracellular fluid, the fluid on the outside of the human cells. Now, <clears throat> let me raise a question. Is your skin made up of cells? Yes. yes. So you say, I don't feel any fluid here. Well, of course, are these cells alive? They're dead. And one of the reasons why they're dead is because they're in contact with air. Because cells cannot live surrounded by air. They die very quickly. Now, if you've ever scraped your skin, scraped your arm, your knee, you may have scraped off some of those top layers of dead cells, and you might have seen a clear fluid start to ooze. Right? You ever know what I'm talking about? Yeah. That clear fluid is the tissue fluid. That means you've reached the layer of living cells. All right? When that's, you see this clear fluid starting to ooze. If we opened up the inside of your abdomen, we saw this fluid surrounding all the internal organs of your body. That fluid is keeping those cells alive. We're going to have more to say about that as we go on. But before we do, our main focus today uh, is metabolism. Now, the word metabolism means biochemical, metabolic or biochemical reactions. How you've heard the word metabolism is that people will sometimes say, you know, I think I've got a slow metabolism. <laughs> they're making a comment, whether they're correct or not, they're making a comment about the speed of the biochemical reactions in their body. So metabolism, metabolic, just means biochemical reactions. All living things have two categories of biochemical reactions, two types of biochemical or metabolic reactions, anabolic and catabolic. Let me give you the big picture of this, and then we'll look at the details. On page B2, at the bottom of B2, under letter C, where it says maintaining body weight, weight reduction and growth. So I uh, wrote this amazing diagram. And this will help us understand the two categories of biochemical reactions. All the biochemical reactions occurring in you are called your metabolism. We divide them into anabolic reactions and catabolic reactions. Anabolic, and we've seen that word before uh, uh, when we spoke of anabolic steroids like testosterone, anabolic are growth reactions. So among the biochemical reactions occurring in our body are those associated with growth, and it's occurring all the time. So when you've heard of the term anabolic steroids, those are drugs or hormones that increase or promote growth. But at the same time, there's also catabolic reactions. Catabolic reactions are associated with the breakdown of food for energy. The breakdown of food for energy. We're always breaking down food to release energy 
And we, as we've already alluded to, and we're going to develop, that energy that's released from the breakdown of, food, of our food is used to make ATP. So we're doing both. How do you remember catabolic is like breaking apart food for energy? Think of catastrophic, catastrophes, right? Things falling apart, breaking apart. Think of cats ripping up your couch, all right? So that's cat catabolic. So we are both carrying on anabolic and catabolic reactions at the same time. Let's examine these in more detail. Back on page B1, so there are different types of anabolic reactions, anabolic or growth reactions. So among the most important that we have already covered are dehydration synthesis reactions. We actually began today with that. Dehydration synthesis is when we commonly join organic molecules together by removing water. So that's how sugars are joined together to form disaccharides and polysaccharides by dehydration synthesis reactions. So when you join a whole bunch of glucoses together, you form a large polysaccharide called glycogen. That's a growth process. We are forming a large complex organic molecule from smaller molecules sugar molecules. A second example we've already learned about, when you, we join three fatty acids to glycerol, it forms a triglyceride. What cells in the body do that? Which cells in our body join three fatty acids to glycerol to form triglycerides? Which cells? Adipose cells. Did we cover that? Yes, we have, last week. Uh, so that's a growth reaction. If those fat cells are forming a lot of triglycerides inside the fat cells, you're getting fat. You're increasing the amount of triglyceride fat in your fat cells. Um, uh, uh, cells, especially muscle cells, join amino acids together to form large complex proteins. Right? And so you've all had biology, you've had anatomy, you learn that in muscle cells, there's a lot of a couple of proteins called actin and myosin. So if you are joining a lot of amino acids together into actin and myosin protein in your muscle cells, you're growing bigger. These are all growth or anabolic processes. If you join nucleotides together into nucleic acids, large nucleic acids like DNA or RNA, these are growth reactions. So in dehydration synthesis reactions, these are when we join organic molecules by removing water, forming larger, more complex molecules. There's another type of anabolic reaction that I haven't given you by name, but I have alluded to it. These are called reduction reactions. A reduction reaction is when a molecule gains hydrogen atoms and electrons. Whenever a molecule gains hydrogens and electrons, it, make, it gains energy and it makes it, uh, it's a type of anabolic process. <clears throat> now, the mnemonic or memory aid that I've given you for this is RIG. Reduction is a gain of hydrogens and electrons. So many of you may have seen that mnemonic or memory aid before when you had biology or chemistry. Uh, or whatever, another uh, mnemonic that's given is GER, G-E-R, gain of electrons is reduction. All right, now, where we've alluded to this before is back on page A8, and you might say, what was on page A8? So let's return back to page A8, and on page A8, you'll remember that we were looking at fatty acids. And we mentioned uh, last, uh, when we spoke about fatty acids, that uh, we talked about how they make margarine. Remember how they make margarine? They take polyunsaturated fatty acids, such as corn oil, and they attach hydrogen atoms onto this molecule, turning it into a saturated fat. And we call that, when we do that, we call these hydrogenated vegetable oils. So this would actually be a type of reduction reaction. Because a reduction reaction is when, you, uh, when a molecule gains hydrogens and electrons. When it gains hydrogen atoms and electrons, 
And now it contains more calories of energy, and saturated, saturated fats do contain more calories of energy than unsaturated fats. That's called a reduction reaction. It is another type of anabolic or growth reaction. Now, on page B2, on page B2, we said that in addition to these growth or anabolic reactions, including uh, uh, dehydration synthesis and reduction reactions, there are catabolic reactions, which involve the splitting apart of large molecules into smaller molecules. All right? It, this occurs when we digest food, right? We break apart large molecules into smaller molecules. And it also occurs when we, the way we produce energy. Because the way we produce energy is we break apart sugars and fats to release energy to make ATP. Page B2. All right? Now, there are two types of catabolic reactions that I want to refer you to. The first one we've already covered, hydrolysis reactions. Hydrolysis ostensibly are the exact opposite of dehydration synthesis reactions. It's when we add water to break a molecule apart. So when we have glycogen and it's broken back apart into individual glucose molecules by adding water, that's a hydrolysis reaction. What's that root lysis mean? What's lysis? Break to break apart. It means to break apart. Hydro means with water. When a triglyceride in a fat cell is broken back apart into three fatty acids and glycerol, that's by a hydrolysis reaction. That's a catabolic process. We're breaking molecules apart. When you have a large polypeptide chain and you break it apart back into amino acids by adding water, that's called a hydrolysis reaction, a catabolic process. Uh, when you have a large nucleic acid, you break it back apart into individual nucleotides by adding water. That's a hydrolysis reaction. That is a catabolic process. There's another type of catabolic reaction that I haven't explicitly spoken of, uh, but you should have heard of it from other courses. We'll talk about it now. They're called oxidation reactions. Oxidation reactions ostensibly are the exact opposite of a reduction reaction. In a chemistry course, they call, cover, call these in a chapter in a chemistry book, oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions. <clears throat> now, an oxidation reaction is when a molecule loses hydrogens and electrons. It's the exact opposite of reduction. The mnemonic or memory aid I've given you is OIL. Oxidation is a loss of hydrogens. So if you remember an oil ring, Oxidation is a loss of hydrogens. Reduction is a gain of hydrogens. Sometimes people have also heard Leo Ger. Loss of electrons is oxidation. Uh, gain of electrons is reduction. But we'll use oil rig. If you forget that, oil rig, if you just look out the window right behind you, can you see the oil rig on the top of the hill? Does everybody see it? All right. That should be a reminder of oxidation is a loss. Reduction is a gain. Now, uh, an example of an oxidation reaction that we're going to be learning more about is this one right here, which everybody has heard, learned originally in a bi college biology and or microbiology class. C6H12O6, that's the molecular formula for glucose, can be broken apart with six molecules of oxygen into six carbon dioxides and six waters and the release of energy. This is an oxidation reaction that we're going to talk more about. And so this breaking apart of uh, this removal of hydrogen atoms and electrons from the sugar molecule uh, uh, releases energy. And we're obviously breaking apart the molecule. That's what our main focus is going to be very shortly. But just before we do, uh, I've listed right here the term free radicals. You'd say, what are free radicals? Are those like crazy people who are like radical? No, free radicals is a term that's used for certain chemicals that strip off hydrogens and electrons off organic molecules. In other words, free radicals oxidize or remove hydrogens and electrons off organic molecules, altering them. 
So it, it's believed that these so-called free radicals that strip off hydrogens and electrons off the organic molecules in our body alter the organic molecules in our body, which seems to probably increase our risk of aging, of our cells aging quickly, and even increase our risk of causing normal cells to become cancerous cells. So this is why there's this interest in what are called antioxidants. We mentioned earlier how vitamin E and vitamin C are antioxidants. So if oxidation is the removal of hydrogens and electrons, which is caused by free radicals, doesn't it sound, doesn't, can you hear the word that an antioxidant, literally that means to prevent oxidation. So that's, those are believed to reduce oxidation of organic molecules by free radicals and thereby prevent this aging process, at least an accelerated aging process, and uh, the increased risk of cancer. There's more to say about this subject, but that's all I'm going to say. So you should understand what a free radical is. It's something that causes oxidation of an organic molecule. It means it strips off hydrogens and electrons, altering it. And you should understand that vitamin E and vitamin C, which are called antioxidants, uh, prevent this removal of hydrogens and electrons by the free radical. Now, uh, let's come here and just summarize this whole main point again. Uh, so, all the biochemical reactions occurring in your body are called your metabolism. There are both growth reactions and there are breakdown reactions, releasing energy. Now, looking out at you in this room, at all of us, all of us in this room are adults. You'd say, what are you going to talk about, something dirty? No. <laughs> By adults, here's what I mean. All of us are as tall as we're going to get. All of us are as tall as we're going to get. We're done growing taller. There's only one direction we can still grow in. We can grow wider. On the assumption that we don't really want to grow wider. If we don't want to grow wider, that means that we've got growth reactions occurring in us all the time that are going to make us grow wider. Because we're going to accumulate sugars as glycogen, accumulate uh, fatty acids as, as triglycerides, accumulate uh, amino acids as proteins, and so on. Those are all going to make us grow wider because we can't grow taller. So assuming that we are doing these anabolic growth reactions all the time, we must break down these organic molecules as fast as we make them. So however fast you are forming glycogen, triglycerides, proteins, and nucleic acids, you must be breaking them down at the same rate. If you break them down as fast as you make them, you will stay the same width. But if you form them, if you form these organic molecules faster than you break them apart, then you'll grow wider. Does everybody follow that? Now, admittedly, it's obviously healthier to increase the amount of proteins in your muscle cells than to increase the triglycerides in your fat cells. But in either case, the person does just grow wider. All right. So whether they're growing wider because of more fat or they're growing more wider because of more muscle, they're just growing wider. They're not growing taller. In fact, we might ask, how would somebody get thinner? How would somebody get thinner? It seems to me that if you want to get thinner, you've got to slow down these growth reactions or, and or speed up the breakdown reactions. How can you slow down these growth reactions? Eat less. The way that you form the glycogen, the way that you form the triglycerides, the way you form all these large molecules is with what you're putting into your mouth. If you eat less sugars, you can't form so much glycogen. If you eat fewer fatty acids, you can't form as many triglycerides. So by eating less, that slows down those growth reactions. Does that make sense? All right, and you've all heard, you want to get thinner? Eat less. Now, how can we speed up the breakdown of organic molecules? Exercise. Because when you start to exercise, the, the, your muscles need to break down these foods at a faster rate, these organic molecules, to make ATP. So the more you exercise, the faster you break down those glycogen, those sugar carbohydrate stores, those triglyceride, those fat stores, and so on, as a source of energy to make ATP. 
So all we're really saying is this, and you already know it. You want to get thinner? Eat less, exercise more. I just want you to use these terms. You want to slow down the anabolic growth reactions. You want to speed up the catabolic breakdown reactions that release energy. Does everybody follow that? Now, one last uh, consideration. What about in children? In a child, right, 10-year-old, do we want this child's, do we want these to be in balance? No. Because if they're in balance, the child stays the same size, right? If we have these in balance in us, we stay the same size. We, don't want, we want them in balance because otherwise we grow wider. But a child can still has the potential to grow taller. So in a child, we want these anabolic growth reactions to exceed the catabolic reactions. So because if they, if they don't, if these are in balance, the child stays the same height. So any child that's growing taller that means they are forming organic molecules faster than they're breaking them down. So an example that I like to give of where somebody's anabolic reactions are exceeding their catabolic are 15 and 16 year old boys. Because as you know, uh, girls go through their growth spurt a couple of years before boys do. So usually around 13, 14 years old, most girls start to grow. And usually around 13, 14 years of age, that's 7th or 8th grade, most girls are taller than the boys of the same grade level. Boys, it takes a couple more years before they go through their growth spurt. And at the time they start to grow, they start eating everything in the house. Right? So if you've got food, right? If like uh, somebody makes, makes some chicken, right? So everybody else takes one piece of chicken, maybe two, they take four. And that's just the beginning. Then they go back for seconds or thirds. When they open up the refrigerator, a 15, 16-year-old boy, they bit like, our, uh, like a vacuum cleaner, they <laughs> suck up all the food in the entire refrigerator. So there's no food left for anybody else. All right? That's okay because they are growing taller. They're going through this growth spurt. Here's the problem we all hit, hit though, females and males. When you stop, when you reach your growth, uh, uh, maximal height, which is going to occur by the time you're about 20 or so. So now, if you're still eating like you did when you were still growing taller, if you're still eating that way, once you hit about 20, then which direction do you start growing in? Wider. Wider. And this is why what always happens as people go from high school to college is they start getting, gaining weight. Because everything was going great in high school because people were growing taller, and then all of a sudden, uh, you hit college, you're done growing taller, there's only one direction to grow it. And so you have to change the heat, eating pattern. So it's a challenge everybody has when they stop growing taller. All right, so those are the terms we're going to use. Now, at the very bottom of the page, it says review of cellular structure. We're reviewing cells right now. Let's take a quick look at page B30 and B31. So on page B30, So this is page B30, and it has pictures of cells. All right, and here's a picture of a cell, and it describes, right, we've got the uh, mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi complex and the ribosomes and all that. Uh, did you cover this in uh, college biology? Yeah. Did you cover this in anatomy? Yeah. All right, yeah, and in fact, on page B31, on B31, you've got this summary chart of what all these different organelles inside of a cell, what they look like and what they do. Since you learned it in biology, since you learned it in anatomy, uh, how many times do you have to cover it? We have now reviewed it. That's it. That's our review. <laughs> all right? You should, you should know this already. Which takes us to page B3. All right, cellular respiration. Now, <clears throat> what is cellular respiration? Cellular respiration looks like this. It is a very complex series of biochemical reactions involving many, many steps and many different enzymes catalyzing every single step. 
It involves the controlled breakdown of foods like sugars and fats to release energy. And that energy that's released is used to make ATPs. So the whole purpose of cellular respiration, I've written right here, is to make ATP. That's the entire purpose of it. So don't get lost, you know, as far as what the whole purpose of it is. Now, over the years, I found I've had students who learned cellular respiration in biology, and I heard it again in microbiology, and, uh, and they will tell me, yeah, I had to learn all that stuff, you know, a lot of steps. And I said, what was it about? And they said, I have no idea what it was about. I just memorized it, and I have no idea what any of it was for. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into tremendous detail on this, because I'm more interested that you actually understand what it's for than that we get lost in all this detail. So again, the whole purpose of it is to break apart foods, releasing energy, and that energy is used to phosphorylate to add a phosphate onto ADP and form this gasoline that powers cells called ATP. Now, this raises a, a question, though, before I even get into this overall reaction. Over the years, students will say, well, I, I'm really mixed up. It sounds like you're saying that we're using foods like sugars, and we're going to take the foods like sugars, which contain energy, and turn them into an ATP molecule which contains energy. So I don't understand what's the whole purpose of it. We've got sugars. Why don't we just use sugars for energy? Why do we have to turn them into ATP? So uh, here's an analogy I commonly give. Let's imagine you went to a coin-operated laundromat. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Where they use usually quarters to run the washer and dryer. Now, I don't know why, but when they design these coin-operated laundromats, they almost always run on quarters. I don't know why. Let's imagine you've got a $10 bill. So you've got to turn the $10 bill into quarters in order to use the washer and dryer. So they usually have a change machine there. You take your dollar bill, $5 bill, $10 bill, or whatever, you stick it in the change machine, and a $10 bill, if you put it in, you'll get 40 quarters. You get four quarters for one dollar, 40 quarters for ten dollars. Now you've got 40 quarters and you can now use them in these coin-operated machines to wash and dry your clothes. So you'd say, what's the whole point of the story? Here's the point. The cellular respiration is like a change machine. I don't know why, just like I don't know why the machines, the washer and dryers only run on quarters, all the biochemical reactions in living things run on ATP. So you've got to take the energy that's in sugars and turn it into ATP molecules. Turning sugars into ATPs is like converting $10 bills into quarters. Once you've turned it into quarters or ATP, now you can run all the biochemical reactions in living things. This also clarifies another point. Even though they, we call ATP a high energy nucleotide, in fact, a glucose molecule contains far more energy than an ATP. A glucose is like a $10 bill. An ATP molecule is like a quarter. All right, so if you're asked which one has actually more energy, a sugar molecule or an ATP molecule, a sugar molecule contains a lot more energy because from one sugar, we're going to get a lot of ATP. So how does this change machine work? So this is the overall reaction right here. All right, so what this shows is we have glucose, C6H12O6. It contains energy in the form of those covalent bonds that are holding these carbon and hydrogen atoms and carbon-carbon uh, atoms together. When you break these covalent bonds, energy is released. And that energy is going to be used to make ATP. Now, uh, as this sugar is going to be split apart into smaller and smaller pieces, breaking these bonds, and the hydrogen atoms are going to be split off this molecule. Now, the problem is, what do we do with the hydrogen atoms that are broken off the sugar molecule? And your first thought is, I don't know, what do you mean do with it? I mean, what, who, what difference does it make? 
A cell cannot simply break hydrogen atoms off a sugar molecule. It, it has to do something with the, hydrogen, the loose hydrogens. Why? Because if it doesn't, that increases the acidity in the cell, and it will kill the cell. So this explains why we breathe oxygen. We inhale oxygen so that the hydrogen atoms that are being broken off the sugar molecule can be <laughs> smacked onto oxygen. And when those hydrogens are attached to oxygen, it forms H2O, water. Water is harmless. That's why you're breathing oxygen. If at the end of this course, I ask you, as a final essay question, among others, you know, explain why we breathe oxygen. If your only answer is to live, <laughs> then you haven't learned anything in this class because everybody knows you need oxygen to live. So why do you breathe oxygen? I wrote it right here in big print. Oxygen is a hydrogen acceptor. It accepts the hydrogen atoms that are being split off the sugar molecules as they're being broken apart to release energy and make ATP. That's why you're breathing oxygen. It's very clever. So now you attach those hydrogens onto oxygen forming water, and now it's totally harmless. It has not increased the acidity. Now, one of the most important coenzymes that's involved in transferring these hydrogens, transferring them from the sugar to the oxygen, is NAD. NAD, we learned earlier, is a coenzyme containing the B vitamin niacin. So you, now you understand one of the most important roles of niacin is transferring hydrogen atoms and electrons. Now, uh, as the hydrogens uh, are being removed from the sugar, and the sugar is being broken apart. So the sugar is now basically being broken apart into individual carbon dioxide molecules, CO2 molecules. Now there is a term we use when hydrogen atoms are being removed from a molecule. It's called oxidation. Remember, oil rig. Oxidation is a loss of hydrogen atoms. So hydrogens are being removed from the uh, sugar, so we would say that the sugar, or glucose, is being oxidized into carbon dioxide. That means the hydrogens are being removed from it. Now, if hydrogens are being removed from the sugar, where did we say they went? They are being added to oxygen. Well, there's a term we use when a molecule gains hydrogens. We say it's become chemically reduced. So oxygen, as hydrogens are attached to oxygen, oxygen is chemically reduced into water. So this is an oxidation reduction reaction. That's what it is. We say sugars are being oxidized into carbon dioxide. Now, as this, uh, this whole process is called cellular respiration, it really involves many, many, many steps because we don't want to do this in a single step because it would be an explosive release of energy. So there are many, many little steps to release this energy in a very controlled way. Uh, uh, so therefore, there are many enzymes and many coenzymes involved in this process. But this energy is being released. The energy is being released uh, uh, as the sugar is being broken apart. About 40% of the energy that's released from breaking apart this sugar molecule is used to attach phosphates onto ADP and form ATP, right? This kind of gasoline that power cells. These are the quarters that we talked about. Now, uh, there's enough, that 40% of the energy that's being released and used to make uh, ATPs is enough to make about 38 ATPs. Now, some books will say 36, sometimes it's 34, and in fact, different cells produce slightly different amounts of ATP. The greatest amount of ATP that can be produced in any cell, like muscle cells, is a maximum of about 38. And I, I'm using that, so it's, notice that it's a little bit like my earlier example, that a $10 bill will give you 40 quarters, and a glucose molecule will give you not quite 40, but 38 ATP. All right, so obviously these are smaller packets of energy than a glucose. However, the majority of energy that's released goes off as heat. The majority of the energy that was released goes off as heat. This is actually predicted by the second law of thermodynamics, known as the law of entropy. 
The second law of thermodynamics, which you would hear about maybe in a biology class, for sure in a chemistry class, is that whenever you convert one form of energy into another form, some of that energy goes off as heat. Here's an example, a light bulb. The purpose of a light bulb is to convert electrical energy into light energy. That's why you have light bulbs. But we know that light bulbs get hot. Some of that electrical energy is being turned into heat. We didn't, that's not why we have light bulbs, but there's no way to prevent that. Well, in fact, over half the energy that was in the sugar molecule just goes off as heat. Now, this is a really, really important reaction. Everything that I've been talking about it, saying about it. Let's summarize why this is such a profoundly important statement about how cells in our body work. This basically explains that in order to make this gasoline that powers cells called ATP, we need two things. We need food and we need oxygen. If we, if we don't have food, we're going to die because we can't make ATP. But even if we have food, if we aren't able to breathe in oxygen, we're also going to die because we have to have both in order to make this gasoline called ATP. Second thing, we've already learned what the role of oxygen is. Oxygen acts as a hydrogen acceptor. Furthermore, we know that not only do we inhale oxygen, we exhale out carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a waste product formed from the breaking apart of food to make ATP. And fourthly, this reaction is very important because it explains why the temperature of our body is almost 100 degrees. Your body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. You're almost 100 degrees. It's sure as hell not 100 degrees in this room. So where is all this heat coming from? It is being released as the cells of your body are breaking apart sugars to make this gasoline called ATP. So let's just consider what happens when you start to exercise. When you start to exercise, this whole process speeds up inside your muscle cells that you're using. Why? Because you need more ATP to make those muscles work. So as this whole process starts to speed up, you start breaking apart sugars at a faster rate to make ATP. You start inhaling oxygen <laughs> at a faster rate. You're exhaling out your mouth carbon dioxide at a faster rate, and you're getting hot. So this really is the fundamental process occurring in the cells of your body. The moment you start exercising, this whole thing just uh, uh, gets even faster as far as what's going on. Now, before we examine this in more detail, we're going to go off on a slight brief tangent and ask the question, how are the glucose levels, the sugar levels, regulated in our bloodstream? Now that we understand how important sugar is, and that it's used by cells to make ATP, now we can appreciate why it's so important that we maintain a constant normal level of sugar in our bloodstream so that our cells always have enough sugar available to produce this gasoline called ATP. Now the normal amount of sugar in our bloodstream is 100 milligrams of glucose in every 100 milliliters of blood. That's our normal sugar level. Obviously some people may have a lower than normal sugar level, they're hypoglycemic, and some people may have a higher sugar level than normal, they are hyperglycemic. Neither one of those is good. Normally, the, the, the most important term in physiology classes is homeostasis. So we need to maintain a constant normal level. We don't want to have either of these problems. So how is our sugar level regulated and maintained constant in our bloodstream so the cells can make the ATP they need? There are two major hormones that regulate our blood sugar level, insulin, and another one called glucagon. Both of them are protein hormones. We've learned there are steroid hormones and there are protein hormones. Both of these are protein hormones. Let's start with insulin, because we've learned about it already. Insulin is produced by the beta cells in the pancreatic islands. Old information. Glucagon is produced by what are called the alpha cells in the pancreatic islands. 
the alpha cells in the pancreatic islands. This is the Greek letter alpha. <clears throat> now, what does insulin do and what does glucagon do? They are really the opposite of each other. They are the yin and yang of what's going on. Insulin, insulin causes the sugar in our bloodstream. Insulin causes the glucose in our bloodstream to go into the cells. And it causes, insulin's really needed to make glucose be taken up by almost all the cells in our body. Specifically, in the case of liver cells, insulin causes the glucose to be transported into liver cells and stored as glycogen. This process of joining, of, of joining glucose molecules together into a polysaccharide called glycogen is called glycogenesis, a very descriptive term. We see the word glycogen and overlapping it, the word genesis, which means to generate or make, so literally, it means to make glycogen. So what is the effect of insulin on the amount of sugar in the bloodstream? Decreases. It decreases it because it's causing the sugar in the bloodstream to go into the cells, including liver cells. So it lowers the sugar level. So that's really important when you're eating a meal. When you're eating a meal and you're digesting all this food and absorbing all these nutrients and all these sugars, then your sugar levels in your bloodstream is getting too high. So insulin is released from your pancreas, and it causes the sugars to go into your cells, including your liver cells, and be stored as glycogen, and so on. Now, the opposite of this is glucagon. And the name glucagon kind of sounds a little bit like glucose. Glucagon actually causes the glycogen in your liver to be broken back apart into glucose and released back into the bloodstream again. So what is glucagon doing to the amount of sugar in your bloodstream? It's increasing. It's causing the glucose that was stored in your cells to now be released back out into the bloodstream again. This uh, process is called glycogenolysis, a great term. In the word, we have glycogen. And at the end, we've got that very important Greek root, lysis, which means to break apart. So it causes the breaking apart of glycogen back into glucose and released into the bloodstream. So if you haven't eaten anything in many, many, many hours, you'd say, yeah, that's because you're talking so much in this lecture class, I haven't had a chance to eat. So if you haven't eaten, how are you maintaining your blood sugar level if you haven't eaten anything? The glycogen that was stored in your liver cells is being broken apart into glucose and released into your bloodstream to maintain enough sugar in your blood so that the cells of your body have enough sugar to break apart and make ATP, that gasoline. So in these, by means of these two opposite hormones, our sugar level in our bloodstream can be maintained more or less constant. So that's what, the way they test you for diabetes, some of you know, is one of the possible tests is they may give you a whole bunch of really sickeningly sweet sugar to drink. Has anybody ever done this? Yeah. Right, when they make you drink this, it's more, if, even if you like sugar, this is more than you ever wanted. Yeah. Now, in a nor and then they start che checking your blood levels, right? They draw blood from you. Yeah. Because a normal person, when you drink all the, eat all that sugar, as the sugar starts to enter your bloodstream, insulin is, should normally be released and make that sugar go into your cells, lowering the amount of sugar in your blood. If they check your blood levels and you've got really high sugar levels, it's not working. It, the mechanism isn't working. Because insulin should have caused the sugar levels to drop back down, but it's not. All right, now, uh, I've summarized this on the next page, B4. On page B4 at the top, so at the top of page B4, it shows diagrammatically a liver cell. And so it shows glucose in the bloodstream. Here's a glucose molecule. It's a monosaccharide. And uh, this glucose, insulin, causes the glucose to go into the cell. And the glucose can either be broken apart into CO2 and water for energy, but especially in liver cells, the special function of liver cells is to take these glucoses into the liver cell and join them together into a polysaccharide called glycogen. So insulin is causing the sugar in our bloodstream 
to be stored as glycogen in the liver cells. Now, when you need that sugar, though, then glucagon hormone is released. And what does glucagon do? And according to this, also epinephrine is another hormone that does this, but we're focusing on glucagon. It causes the glycogen to be broken apart. That's called glycogenolysis into glucose and released back into the bloodstream. So obviously, between insulin and glucagon, we have a way of either, when our sugar level gets too high, lowering it, or when our sugar level gets too low, raising it. With this in mind, let's look at this lower diagram. This lower diagram shows what we would call the absorptive state. You'd say, what's that mean, the absorptive state? The absorptive state means when you're absorbing a meal. Now first, just before we get into the absorptive state, here it shows that for most cells in the body, the glucose that's circulating in our bloodstream, this is the bloodstream, the sugar, the glucose that's in our bloodstream is used by most cells in the body, and it says it's oxidized. Oxidation is the breaking apart of sugars, the splitting off of those hydrogens, and it's oxidized into carbon dioxide, and it forms water. That's called the oxidation of glucose. And the whole purpose of breaking apart the glucose was to make these quarters called ATP, to run all the biochemical processes in cells. Now, when you're absorbing a meal called the absorptive state, so you're absorbing, you ate that, all that food. Remember, all the carbs are broken apart into sugars and absorbed into your bloodstream. The fats were broken apart into fatty acids absorbed into your body. Proteins were broken apart into amino acids absorbed into your bloodstream. Let's first see what happens to uh, fatty acids. The fat, fatty acids are largely carried to your adipose tissue. What's that? Fat tissue. And those fatty acids are stored in the fat cells as triglycerides. Have we ever learned about that before? Yeah, that's how fatty acids are stored in our fat cells as triglycerides. Now, those are, it's a reversible reaction, and when we need fats for energy, we can break apart the triglycerides back into fatty acids and use them for energy as well. You'll even notice here that it shows glucose can even go into fat cells, and when it goes into fat cells, the arrow shows that the glucose can be turned into fat. Have we ever mentioned that? Didn't we have, aren't we all aware that if you eat a lot of sugar, you become fat? So it can be turned into it. So that's what it shows. Now, what else does it show? It also shows amino acids that were absorbed from the proteins that we digested in our food. Now, uh, most of the amino acids, while they're used by all the cells in our body, they are especially used in our muscle cells to form proteins like actin and myosin. So most of the amino acids that we absorb from the food that we eat are used by our muscle cells to make muscle proteins like actin and myosin. But our, and, and here it shows amino acids can also go to the liver and be used by the liver to make proteins as well that we'll talk about. But our main focus right now is sugar, just glucose itself. So you'll notice the glucose is absorbed into the bloodstream, but it, we might be absorbing a whole lot, a lot of sugar. Right? Because we ate a lot of carbs. Carbs are sugars. So uh, if the sugar level is getting too high, then uh, insulin is going to cause the sugar, especially to go into liver cells. And when it enters the liver cells, it's turned into liver glycogen. Now it can also go into muscle cells and be turned into muscle glycogen. Have we talked about this? That's where glycogen is stored. And this is, again, a reversible process so that when we need that sugar, the glycogen can be broken back apart into glucose and raise the blood sugar level. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, just before we go any further, uh, all of this information that I'm covering right now and continuing to cover is largely in a chapter on metabolism in your textbook. Now, the pages are in the syllabus. You've got the syllabus. If you've lost your copy, you can download one right from my website. The chapter that deals with metabolism is chapter 25. It's in the syllabus. You can look at it.
But uh, in chapter 25, I'm going to get to 25 right now. Yeah, so chapter 25 is entitled Metabolism and Nutrition. If you've got a different physiology book, believe me, there's a chapter on metabolism in it, if, if, if it's not 25, uh, you know, in, in your book. And uh, here, it, just to show you, here it talks about metabolic reactions. It deals with anabolic and catabolic. It speaks of all the stuff I just covered. Here it covers energy transfer, oxidation reduction reactions. Do you think this might be beneficial to read it over to make sure you're on top of this? All right, here it talks about mechanism of ATP generation. So in case you think what I'm speaking about right now, well, I don't think that's part of a physiology book. It's right here, all right, in metabolism. Here it covers carbohydrate metabolism, and it gets into all the details of cellular respiration that I'm going to be covering. But if you uh, also flip ahead uh, in chapter 25, look at this. This is chapter 25 still, right? Here it says absorptive state reactions. Ooh, you know what this is? This is the exact same picture in color that is in your lecture outline. And do you think the book covers all this in details as far as what's going on? What do you think? So this is right from the book, all right? And look at all this stuff. So it's explaining all that's happening in our body in terms of what we're doing with the nutrients that we absorb uh, when we eat a meal. 